Hi everyone, thank you for coming on time for the session. And uh, I think I can see Dr. Mona Mittal also here, although we are meeting for the first time, so we are looking forward to the meeting. We have uh, Professor Mosini with us, uh, and uh, Deepak would be introducing her in detail. Um, she's part of Chindal University, and she's also the member secretary of the Ethics Committee of Chindal Film University. And uh, we thought that it would be a good idea to, you know, uh, have her and Professor Arthita Gupta as the speakers for today. Um, so over to the best So, Mohsin Mukherjee is an Associate Professor, Deputy Director of the International Institute of Higher Education Research and Capacity Building, and also Founding Executive Director of the Center for Comparative and Global Education at uh, our university. She's also an honorary Senior Fellow of the University of Melbourne Graduate School of Education. And added to that, she had uh, successfully completed uh, uh, various uh, leadership positions. Uh, just to mention a few, she's a Vice President of Research and Partnerships Development of the STAR Research Network and a Research Standing Committee member of the World Council of Comparative Education Societies. As far as her publications are concerned, she has more than 30 plus internationally peer reviewed journal articles, books and co-edited book with reputed publishers. Just to mention a few, Rutledge, uh, Bilsen, Sage, Stringer, and Oxford, OAP. And last but not least, the most, uh, you know, distinguished uh, aspect of her uh, work is she's a Fulbright scholar, uh, alumina, who also worked as an educational consultant with international and national organizations such as NCRT, UNESCO, and World Bank. Uh, so we have a very distinguished speaker. It's a privilege to introduce her and looking forward to listening to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa, for kind introduction. And thank you, uh, Professor Derek Lindquist and the uh, leads over here from uh, the uh, Psychology and Counseling School. And I'm really glad to meet all of you in person over here. And uh, I would really um, uh, give you, I'm, I'm sure all of you have uh, some understanding of research and publication ethics as university faculty members, but any specific questions with regards to the policies and procedures uh, with respect to our own university here at Rupi Jindal, I'm going to uh, uh, talk more about that. And But more than me talking, I would really request all of you to be really open uh, with questions. Okay, so take this opportunity uh, to ask as many questions as you might have in your mind. Uh, but in my presentation, I will uh, definitely try to clarify. I've done uh, some of these presentations before for our faculty. So based on... Uh, the, the kind of queries faculty make uh, and made the presentation so that, you know, uh, you will see maybe even before asking the queries are clarified, but that shouldn't stop you from asking questions, okay? So please feel, feel free to stop me and ask questions. Let me see whether this slide is moving or not. It's not moving, it's stuck. But uh, what is research ethics? I'm sure all of you have a good understanding of what is research ethics. Um, but, you know, um, don't take it otherwise, but I would really like to hear from some of you your own understanding of research ethics. Uh, who is going to share your thoughts? Please, please feel free to share. I, I, I don't like doing one-way presentation. 
I always like to make, have a dialogue with the audience. So I'd really like to hear from you what is, what, what, what is research ethics for you? Let me be the devil's advocate uh, by sharing some negative qualities about research and publication ethics. I have had faculty members coming up and telling me, without sharing names, I'll tell you, what is this unnecessary bureaucracy you people have set up? You're making our life difficult. <laughs> you know, unnecessary paperwork. Uh, you know, already our lives are so burdened uh, as uh, faculty members, teaching, research, uh, uh, you know, all other responsibilities on top of it, additional paperwork uh, for RERB. What, what is this? So do you also feel the same way or you have some other thoughts in your mind? Just to provoke you to speak, I wanted to share this. Okay, I can go. Well, it's a comment of set of guidelines for any researcher uh, to adhere uh, while one is producing knowledge, one should also see to that it doesn't harm anyone and it follows certain universal norms. Uh, that's my understanding of it. That's really good. So none of you think it's unnecessary in this room. Uh, as a feel free, very free to you know be the devil's advocate. Why? Why? Why do we need to do this? See, uh, we all are from psychology, so we know the uh, need of it. Very sensitive. Very yeah. sensitive. So you, all of you are already highly sensitized about the need for it, right? And why, why, why use such ethics? So obviously, so I, I don't need to further go into more explanation into it. All of you already know about it, so I'm quickly skipping. Why do ethics matter? Of course. Can I just mention about what is unethical research behavior, okay. if that helps. So because of the two experiences, recent experiences with me, so uh, one of my published works was copied as it is, including the references by somebody else and a so-called esteemed uh, professor from another university. But then action was definitely taken by that particular institution. Uh, however, the uh, compl I mean, the whole process is quite complicated. I mean, it's great to say things that you know these are the ethics this is what integrity means but to follow it and who analyzes it and who takes care of it the regulations uh, that's you know something you know i would like you to probably uh, talk more about then um, who would be the first author who would be the second author third author many a times in the university setups also when you're working as students uh, you are the one who has written the first draft and as per the author guidelines the international guidelines um, the person who writes the first draft becomes the first author, mm -hmm. but then till date, uh, that is something, uh, you know, the students are also exploited a lot mm -hmm. uh, because of, uh, let's say, you know, the lack of knowledge or the lack of awareness and it's later on they get to me. And uh, <clears throat> the person who needs to be the senior author, the corresponding author, the professor, they usually become the first author and the students who have done the, you know, major work, they take the second or the third place. I think that is also uh, the unethical behavior. Yes, so it's I'm very, very problematic. Problem. And we have all gone through these. Uh, the, each one of us in this room, I'm sure, at some stage of their life and career have gone through uh, this kind of exploitation, right? So there's a need uh, behind ghost writing for other people, all kinds of issues. Uh, if I can say, I don't see that as ghost writing myself. Now your first scenario on the pre again, it's just stupefying that these people would attempt to do what we do. It's a horrible, horrible situation. But the second, authorship should always be decided up front. Absolutely. Otherwise, you get the situation. Yeah, out. yeah. But as a PI, you are providing the facility, the expertise, typically the supplies, the money. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. But in my field, we're usually last author, but first or last. To me, I don't see that as any ethical conundrum at all. You are the PI of that lab and of that research. Therefore, right. you should take precedence. In it. Yeah, but Derek, I was not talking about a project. I was not talking about something which was just so. When something is discussed upfront, who would take you know? So ICNJE uh, guidelines clearly say who can be the first author or the second author. That's not a personal experience. That's more of you know what has happened with others. Um, but yeah, these things do happen. So it's not related to many times. It may not be part of the project, 
but the other people would have done the whole work and they are not given the first or third and later on you know uh, so they had applied for it so uh, it becomes very complex as a process so what you are saying you know agreed to that of course the pi is the one you know who will take the uh, final decision that you know who will take you know who will be the lead for which uh, particular part but i'm talking about uh, instances where three people had agreed to talk, you know do some work and they agreed upon certain authorship but the person who was corresponding to the journal uh, you know towards the end uh, it it's, it came to the picture that that person became the first author and once the proofreading is done everything is done the other people can't really do anything apart from just complaining so that's something which we can actually i mean that, that is definitely unethical because once you have decided something and then not informing the other authors and i think that would probably will be coming let, let me let me quickly get to 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 what i'm here to discuss with all of you here frankly speaking and the work that we do here at jg arya we frankly speaking you know publication comes at a much later stage our jg arya these work really doesn't encompass all these issues that you're talking about with regards to plagiarism or authorship related issues um uh, there is a global level committee these days called co committee on publication ethics and there are research deans office in different universities like our university also we have every school has a research dean and there's a university level research deans office professor indrat gupta headed by professor indrat gupta from law school so these kind of complaints would ideally go to the research deans office um a research ethics committee might could be also consulted at some stage but you know our job at the jju arrp is actually comes much much before you get to the writing stage okay so our job is to ensure that all the research uh, researchers in jju faculty and students who are doing research with primary subjects humans as primary subject to look at uh, the uh, to the, the research design so that the research has been designed following uh, internationally uh, accepted uh, standards of ethics okay and ethical uh, conduct with regards to research that involves human and animal subjects of course there are very few in this university to do, do research involving animal subjects so mostly it's research involving human subjects right and so we review uh, our work is mostly to review the entire research design from a ethical lens even before you go out there and do the research the writing part comes even after that okay so let me just quickly of course as as a researcher all of you i'm sure you are aware of the need Uh, to be ethical in your conduct in terms of honesty uh, the 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 elements of honesty objectivity integrity carefulness openness transparency accountability and also uh, respect for uh, intellectual property or individuals intellectual contribution with regards to certain research that uh, our colleague here was trying to talk about uh, in terms of the contribution as a as a pi of a particular research and uh, the the who who actually designs the entire research and uh, and you might have a team of 10 people including doctoral students post doctoral students or other pi's working for that project but uh, you know who who gets uh, what credit with regards to um the, the outcome of that research and also how do you work uh, ethically as a team uh, in terms of your research conduct and when you involve human subjects in research how do you maintain aspects of um, uh, you know confidentiality and integrity and 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 uh, uh, this entire uh, aspect of beneficence and no harm okay so that whatever research you do these days even with research involving animal subjects researchers need to justify why certain animals are needed 
uh, for doing uh, experimentation uh, for research because obviously in most cases it really um, affects the poor animals in a very negative way. Okay, all kinds of lab experiments and researchers need to really clarify a very, very, if you need, uh, um, um, you know, like minimal harm, they have to literally convince the research ethics committee that as minimal as possible harm, the, uh, uh, they, they will need to uh, do to this poor animals because of the benefit, larger benefit of the society. Uh, that this research is going to yield in the near future. Uh, so, and with regards to human subject, it becomes even more um, imperative, all the more because of a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the unethical practices that happened in the past. Okay, with regards to human subjects, uh, in, uh, their involvement in research, uh, a lot of um, mostly in the medical field, or some even even uh, psychological research, uh, you know, all kinds of research that has involved human subject in the past, and there have been uh, some very very important. Uh, uh, cases, all of you must have known, must be knowing about the Nuremberg trials and, you know, the Belmont report coming out of the United States. Uh, there have been many incidents uh, based on which uh, the, a global consensus was formed that uh, if we are doing research involving human <laughs> subjects, the researchers need to be held responsible. That what the, your research the, the, your act of doing research should not harm any particular individual or a community of people or any, even in any organization and institution. Your job as a researcher is to probe a particular research problem, okay, do systematic research to probe that research problem. You might need human subject involvement <coughs> as part of the research method, but that involvement should be also involve an element of care for the human subject and also animal subject if you if it involves animal subject. Okay, so uh, this is this is this is uh, extremely important. Of course, we have already you know discussed the publication uh, thing before. You know, we kind of jumped the gun and went into talking about publication right at the very beginning. But ethics does matter with regards to research and publication right from the beginning at the stage when you're doing your research design up until the time when you're doing research dissemination, sharing your research findings uh, either with the learned academic community uh, or, or discipline or field of research within which you're doing your research or the larger public. These days, um, you know, they, there has been a lot of awareness also uh, around the world and also a lot of advocacy around the world to even also share your research findings, not just within your own academic community, but with the larger public. Uh, through uh, writing for the media, blogs, all kinds of, you know, um, modes through which you can share your research findings. Because how many people articles and how many people understand disciplinary jargons that we need to use in writing in academic peer-reviewed uh, quote-unquote Scopus Index or Web of Science Index journals? Right? Very few. Only a few researchers who are doing research in that area. Okay? So, so for larger public accountability. But even when you do do these kind of dissemination, okay, how are you disseminating that knowledge? Whether you are really, really following the ethical guidelines and protocols uh, is, is extremely, extremely important. And this is one of the big reasons at here at JGU, right from the very beginning, we are a very young, young university, 13 years old, but from the very beginning since our university was designed to be a research-oriented university, uh, and uh, from the very, the doctoral program was also initiated right from the very beginning when the university was launched, the university authorities uh, the senior administration decided that we need to form a uh, ethics committee. 
as part of the university. Uh, since we are, if we are promoting our faculty and students to do research, we need to also promote the fact that you need to follow ethical guidelines, globally accepted uh, ethical guidelines, so that uh, whatever research is done at the university, it adheres to international standards of research and ethics. And also, uh, anybody doing research at JGU, the research that is undertaken, whether by faculty or student or visiting scholars or whatever, there are no unwarranted issues. As we all know that there has been actually a lot of media reports also, not just here in India, it's actually a global problem. I teach a course for the doctoral students in research and publication ethics. Uh, there has been several case studies, uh, you know, uh, and we, we study them in the class, a number of cases of uh, research related misconduct. Okay, uh, around the world, okay, of course, the numbers are much larger in country like ours, in India, in the global south, where our universities, the modern Indian universities, as all of you in this room might know, or at least some of you might know, were not initially designed to be research oriented. We, we, the modern Indian universities were established mid 1800s in India during British uh, era uh, in, the, in the model of University College London, primarily to train uh, professionals, okay, not as research oriented university. The research orientation of Indian universities is very new post independence, right? So, uh, but at the same time, uh, there wasn't any uh, proper training facility available up until very recently, right before the pandemic 2019, we got a circular from uh, UGC, uh, uh, my colleague here, uh, Derek Lindquist and I, we were all sitting in a research ethics committee meeting and that's when the current director of the research ethics committee, who was then uh, just the director of the doctoral program, shared this letter with us that there's a notification from the UGC and UGC is now wanting all the PhD programs across Indian universities to launch a compulsory two-credit research and publication ethics course. So up until then, uh, I was just teaching one module on research and publication ethics uh, as part of the research methods course to the doctoral students after I joined this university. So I was asked, since I was already teaching this one module for the research methods course to uh, you know, expand that into a full-blown course. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the reason why, of course, uh, the, this was thought to be mandatory, and now the UGC is also saying that, okay, expand it, expand it to also uh, uh, towards, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, not just part of the doctoral training, but also for faculty at large across because there are many universities. We were immediately able to actually start the pub, uh, 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 research and publication ethics course as part of the doctoral program, even in the middle of the pandemic, because we took action very fast. And since we were already offering it as a module as part of our research ethics course, but it wasn't so in other universities. Many universities haven't yet been able to launch it. There are very few ones that have been able to uh, launch uh, the course and run it uh, like we are doing it here. So why why this is was but this is something I should say I I should acknowledge this as the the senior leadership of this university has been actually thinking about it much ahead of time uh, before uh, you know, the UGC in India started thinking about it as late as. Uh, 2019 uh, first semester to right before the pandemic. Okay. So this is the reason uh, the JGU RERB, as you can see, there's, there's a PDF uh, document uh, with, uh, with the guideline, or, uh, and which is something I am going to, after this uh, seminar, I'm going to share it uh, with all of you. Uh, okay, so the the guidelines were created right at the beginning when the university uh, was established. Of course, it has gone through some revisions in recent years, and I'm going to just uh, share some of the highlights from the JGU RERB guideline, the most updated version of the JGU RERB guideline. Of course, as I said, 
these guidelines uh, are solely if you're involving human subjects in research. We have a lot of faculty who do research which doesn't involve human subjects. If you're working with data or uh, which is publicly available, okay, uh, some kind of data set or something that is publicly available, you're not doing any primary data collection, particularly from human subjects, then you don't need to worry about it. But lately, what I'm hearing from a lot of faculty members, and they are sending special requests to us, uh, is lately some of the, uh, the prestigious, reputed, not just Scopus listed, but prestigious, reputed, peer-reviewed international journals, they are now requesting for ethics approval letter. Even if your research may not involve human subjects uh, or primary data collection, even then some journals are, are, are requesting for ethics approval letter. And uh, the UGC also uh, informed us that for the doctoral students, whether their research involves primary subject, uh, humans as primary subject or not, all doctoral students has to go through the ethics approval process, application and approval process as part of their training, as part of the doctoral training. Okay, so this is the reason we have made it mandatory for all doctoral students to submit a ethics approval, uh, an ethics application for approval before they go out to do their research. Once they, their thesis synopsis means the design of the research is approved by the committee, they immediately they need to apply for a ethics committee approval. Okay, and for faculty also, if you are doing research uh, involving a particular, it, it's absolutely mandatory if you're, uh, you know, doing research involving human subjects. And even if your research doesn't involve human subjects, but if you are targeting to publish in journals that has a mandatory requirement like the, the one that I mentioned, I would uh, urge all of you to put in a ethics approval, uh, application for ethic, ethics approval ahead of time, rather than requesting us later on to give, you know, post-dated approvals is, once again, it's, it's unethical. We can't do it. Uh, so uh, we have to turn down a lot of requests from faculty almost every semester. But, you know, it it's just doesn't make sense. Then it really becomes a paperwork and bureaucracy. <laughs> Just to upload your paper into a, you know, for a journal submission, uh, issuing a letter, it's it's really not uh, ethical in that sense, right? So, and as a committee, university committee, we shouldn't do uh, something unethical ourselves. Yes, I just wanted to share um, what we do uh, is we apply uh, if you're using secondary data. And what you write for, so we have different categories, which right. I'm assuming you have. Yes, I'll share those. So right. What now. we apply for under that is exempt. Yes, yes. I, I'll just share that. We have it also in our guidelines, and that's what I wanted to share with all of you over here. Uh, so, of course, uh, the specific objective and outcome of your research should be communicated to research participants in an appropriate way both oral and written mind you this is a new addition we made okay uh, initially it was just written okay? <coughs> but now it is globally accepted in many countries around the world including the united states where a lot of fact, uh, the researchers over there do research internationally i personally at one point of time when i was doing research uh, coming from a U U.S. university to India, and uh, you know all these ethics approval form, informed consent signing form, and all these things really didn't make sense to the people out here in the community. In fact, it it became like a barrier for data collection more than facilitating the process. The, uh, the 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 this paper signing and all these things for the informed consent became a bad li literally a barrier for data collection. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And there are reasons behind it, you know. And uh, but there, there has been so much abuse in the name of doing research, particularly in colonial context, post-colonial context like ours. Uh, there's also a lot of 
uh, you know, uh, lack of faith in the minds of people. Okay, and particularly vulnerable communities. So many, but uh, in many countries, even Western countries around the world, where they do research internationally, they understand these things now. And a lot has been also written about it and researched about it. So oral consent has increasingly become acceptable uh, to research com committees globally in many parts of the world. We did uh, a lot of consultation meetings. Uh, for this and incorporated oral consent as also part of our RDRP guideline. You had a question, please. Yes, not about process per se, I just think about the wording. Mm -hmm. You say subjects as well as participants. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. From my understanding, participants would be more Yes. <laughs> yes. In some of the places, you know, the 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 the, the language has, uh, you know, this is the revised version. I have cut and pasted from the revised version. In some places, the, the older version is still there. So we need to change that. I I totally I totally agree with you, and I hear you. Research participants, yes. Because research subjects, once again, is problematic. It, it really, once again, goes back to the earlier exploitative kind of relationship with the... Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, and also these days, you know, storage of research, especially a lot of work that is nowadays being done online, uh, you know, even cloud stored, uh, uh, research data stored in cloud spaces, right? So uh, this has become a very important concern for research ethics committee these days. How are you planning to uh, store your data so that you know uh, critical information about research participants is not getting leaked and people are not falling into trouble because of you doing research? Because no, no uh, uh, online space is really hundred percent that safe. We you know government. Uh, you know, mails and all these things and offices, uh, you know, internal things are getting hacked and, and, and uh, information getting out there. So it's becoming increasingly important for ethics committee to look into these issues. And also, uh, you know, to, to be very clear uh, with the research participants, avoiding any kind of deception in the part of, you know, the research process when you are get speaking to gain informed consent from your research participants very very important not to get involved in any kind of deception if there is any risk or threat or any even iota of it to tell it straight away on you know explain it and also explain what benefit it is uh, this research is going to be right up front uh, rather than involving in any kind of deception. Uh, so the, the guidelines, as I said, you know, the researchers should provide participants also, particularly if you are researchers do, particularly we do research in humanities and social sciences, right? So many of our researchers often um, seek to recruit participants who are already coming from very vulnerable, marginalized background. They could be refugee commun communities. Um, already their feelings, uh, they, they, they feel extremely insecure, okay, uh, about all the legalities of their presence uh, itself uh, in a particular location. So to at least uh, to, to give them enough, uh, you know, time also, not to push them for, uh, you know, your own convenience to yield informed consent so that they can themselves, you know, consult the people that they trust their own uh, circles of friends or network or whatever uh, to, and the same goes with regards to also if you're involving children. It becomes even more uh, very, very sensitive if you are involving children as research participants. Uh, you know, uh, very important to also get uh, informed consent from whoever is uh, the legal guardian of the children. Okay, legal guardian or parent. Uh, very, very important. So, um, and as I said, you know, in many places, in many organizations, if you're doing collaborative research or research that involves 
a grant coming from a particular funding agency in, uh, these days it has become almost uh, like a mandatory protocol for them to really ask from you research ethics approval letter from your institution because they want to make sure that whatever research that you're doing as part of the funding that has been provided to you is following all the ethical guidelines and protocols okay so uh, as I said, of course, if your research involves children and particularly vulnerable people, you, you know, the, with the, which includes people with disability and those people who are living with any kind of terminal illness, over there, uh, you know, while you're uh, you know, talking about your research design, have you taken enough, um, uh, have you thought through the risks involved? Okay, if there is an emotional breakdown or if there is any disclosure of any kind of abuse or situations like this, have you already identified proper referrals? Uh, you, know, um, as to, you know, I do a lot of research in the field of education. I can share an example from one of my own experiences uh, in a particular school where this little, I was just doing a, like a game, some kind of a gaming activity for a focus group kind of um, discussion with a student and the word uncle was a trigger for one of the girls in the room okay mm -hmm. i had no clue you know uh, the word uncle could become a trigger for this little girl who was literally getting abused and within the larger context, as you know, the kind of taboo and all these things, and uh, this 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 child almost had a breakdown, uh, and I was clueless myself what is going on, and uh, you know, but I, this was something initially it was something I did not contemplate, I did, did not even think about. Let this can happen, and uh, so of of course I immediately uh, referred to the class teacher, and then she went and uh, you know consulted with the counselor, and all the girl was provided whatever help uh, the school authorities could provide her. But you know all kinds of things happen uh, in the field, okay? Particularly when you are doing research involving uh, a vulnerable population which includes children uh, kids and adolescents and 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 uh, you know people with disability and children and you never know or <laughs> even a very harmless sounding word or something can become a trigger for somebody for for something uh, at the back of their mind all of your psychologists over here you would understand this very well okay so very very important and and uh, uh, the, 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 the risk of ethical, this is, this is another thing, uh, you know, we incorporated as part of the uh, uh, guideline document that if you feel like there is any risk of ethical failure that might happen, you know, uh, you, you better acknowledge it. Uh, I remember there was one, one student uh, uh, one of our doctoral students, we went a lot of back and forth with his proposal because it was, uh, it did involve uh, situations where there could be risk of ethical failure because he was explored and in field of psychology, um, emotions uh, and doing some experiments of with human uh, research subjects uh, where, uh, whereby he was exploring particularly negative emotions emotions of fear, anger, you know, all kinds of negative emotions. So it was kind of really kind of, a, a, of experiments and study that he was proposing to do as part of his PhD thesis. So it was very, very important for us to go and do this back and forth for, uh, for him to also, you know, further uh, revise his, uh, you know, um, the, the, the design and, and uh, state, uh, you know, the, 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 the risks involved uh, in it. Uh, now, with regards to what we do at IARB, uh, you know, as uh, our, my colleague here just uh, highlighted, uh, we, we do follow the, the, you know, international standards and also, as I said uh, before, we have three levels of uh, reviews that is done. There are many applications that uh, Professor Pandey, who is currently the uh, chair of the ethics committee, he and I, we just uh, exempt 
we, we, we see these applications and we feel like, okay, they don't need any review, frankly speaking. They fall in the exempt category. So we just uh, send an approval letter immediately, okay? And then uh, there are some applications, and, and these are generally applications, um, uh, you know, which has minimal or no risk. Uh, altogether. Some of these applications don't even involve human subject, uh, the, the human participants uh, as part of the research design. Okay, so uh, we just uh, cleared it in, uh, as part of exam status. Within here, it is mentioned initially uh, from the original document. So I, I should have changed this in the PPT. Initially, for this also, the time period that used to was uh, put in the guideline was two weeks. But you know, uh, the volume of applications and all these things have increased over time. So we don't take uh, two weeks. Within a week, we clear, clear it, the ones that are in the exempt category. Okay, and then uh, the next category is the expedited review category. Okay, and uh, for this also, you know, we send uh, the reviews, uh, the, the application for review to maximum, um, you know, three uh, of our committee members to review. Suppose you are from the psychology school, of, uh, as a faculty, if you put in an application, generally we try to also invite faculty from a couple of other schools, okay, based on availability. We don't send the, the application for review to <coughs> member from the same school, okay. We do, uh, we, we do look at expertise in terms of research methodology and all these things who will be best suitable uh, to review that application. But we generally tend to send uh, them for, Derek has reviewed several applications. He's one of the most active RARV members, I should say, and acknowledge. And thank you so much, Derek, for all that, all the help and, and, and volunteer work that you do, additional volunteer work, and that too with all your responsibility as a dean uh, for RARV. Thank you so much. Uh, so, but uh, for this also, you know, the process uh, takes generally, you know, three to four weeks, you know, the back and forth process does take time. Uh, if the reviewer has uh, sent some comments and queries, so we write back to the applicant uh, that you need to respond to these queries. And then it depends really on you how fast you respond to those queries and send us back the response. And so the four weeks, you know, that's the average time it does take. And you have to cal put that thing in your, you know, like calculation when you are designing your research. Keep this, you know, uh, we often every semester, in spite of all the workshops and uh, all these things we do with faculty, we do receive a request of, oh, I need to get out there. I have just one week's time, you know, this event. This particular person I need to interview or this particular event that I need to go out there and it's, it's just two weeks from now and uh, we need the clear, it's, it's all, it becomes like, okay, this is not just a bureaucratic clearance process so for, you know, like some customs clearance or something like that, you know, you need to give us the time. So please put in your application ahead of time, you know, at least, uh, you know, and it's written in the RIP guideline itself, like six weeks, minimum six weeks ahead of your D deadline date when you actually want to, or planning to go out there and do your research and data collection. So please keep that, uh, you know, uh, you know, put in your application ahead of time, make that calculation. And of course, uh, if your uh, app, um, pro project is something that really needs a full review of the entire committee and a full review and discussion, six weeks definitely it's going to take. You know? it, it, it does take time you know, to go back. And also you need to also keep in mind uh, another fact, you know, it's also like the review process for any journal article. Right. So your application is also going to another faculty colleague here at JG only who are equally busy like you with teaching, with research responsibility, with their family responsibility. On top of it, this service, frankly speaking, volunteer service they are doing for us. 
right, for the research community. So many a times, despite all the, I, I fail myself, you know, uh, it, it happens, you know, we want to uh, review and reply as soon as possible, but we are not able to, you know, so we, <laughs> we, 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 after the second review down reminder or third reminder, we say, <laughs> sorry, sorry, just a little more, maybe one or two days more time. Okay, so this is how, you know, things can get delayed. Okay, so for you as a researcher to keep all these things in mind and rather than, you know, pushing us, you know, me as a secretary and Professor Pandey as a chair, you just can't imagine sometimes we get into such tight spot and the faculty members get really um, upset, uh, you know, and we just, we keep telling them that why did you, submit ahead of your, you know, when you're just submitting your paper application uh, two weeks, uh, within two weeks you want to go out there and do, do what were you doing so now, right? You have uh, mentioned fewer reviewers are required for approval. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the number and how we decide? Is it three, three, minimum three, minimum three reviewers we sent. Okay, for for expedite even for expedited review, the exempt category, me and Professor Pandey, we just clear it. We don't send it for review to anybody. But for expedited review, minimum three reviewers we send it to minimum three. Okay, so and and they are all you know our faculty members. We have two faculty from each school of JGU as part of uh, the uh, RERB committee. Actually, the committee is now getting actually uh, once again reconstituted for your information but i think they're not going to leave either you or me <laughs> they definitely keep uh, so actually some of the um, uh, committee members have not been very responsible unfortunately for whatever reasons they have not been uh, able to review even a single paper you know over the last uh, one or two years so they're now thinking you know to invite a few new members and keep the members who have been very active part of the committee, definitely keep them. But those who have not been able to, for whatever reason, contribute as part of the committee instead of them to invite a few new members. So you will soon receive an email from the registrar office with the names of the reconstituted committee. Uh, very, very soon, actually, I think uh, within a week or two by the first week of March, so we'll know the names of all the <laughs> committee members. Uh, and uh, initially, you know, when they launched the RERB committee, all the ethics application they used to actually go to registrar office. So the old RERB guideline document, some, uh, some of you might uh, ha have still seen it in circulation. It says submit your application to registrar and JGU. It has created a lot of confusion for us. So we are trying to edit out all those. So now we have a separate JGU RERB email, okay? And the entire application form is online. Uh, and uh, that application form, the link to that online application form I'll be sharing with all of you. So you fill out that application online and then you can save it and download it as a PDF, okay? And then you attach that PDF uh, to an email. And if you uh, have some additional documents, uh, like we uh, these days we are also requesting our faculty members and also students, if you are doing research and uh, particularly in social sciences and humanities, uh, um, uh, particularly social sciences uh, within a multilingual context like India, okay? If you are doing research out there in communities who don't understand English, okay, to submit first, even for English, those communities, those who understand English, to submit a plain language statement of your research, okay, in the target language. And whatever the language is, it's, is it Hindi, it's Hindi or Marathi or Tamil or Telugu or Bengali or Urdu, whatever, you submit a plain language statement of your research. 
along with the uh, um, uh, ethics uh, application form. And also, if you're doing like a quantitative survey based research and things like that, to, to submit the survey instrument, okay, uh, as part of your uh, ethics application is very, very important, okay. Or if you're even doing some kind of structured interviews. Uh, with research participants to also submit that as part of your ethics application for review. So the 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 generally there are uh, these are the categories that in terms of decision making we either reject or we tell uh, based on the review feedback we tell the um, uh, you know applicant that you need to make major amendments to your. Uh, proposal or minor amendments or uh, if there is no issue at all we just accept it and uh, send a approval letter immediately okay yes it's counterintuitive for me to think that you have to consider other school faculty members because sometimes uh, the research process of particular discipline undermine good question uh, so can you explain good what question Goes see, in the see, this is this is where our interdisciplinary nature of each and every school of JGU uh, really helps. We then we do tend to send the uh, the application for review to the best possible reviewer in terms of their disciplinary knowledge and also methodological knowledge. But mind you, we have faculty from various different disciplinary background in each and every school. We, we even have philosophers in the law school, <laughs> sociologists, uh, okay, uh, in the in the business school or, you know, so, so we do tend to look into the expertise area, but rather than sending the application to a reviewer from the same school from which the, so suppose Derek is on board with us, Manjushri is on board with us from uh, your school, rather than sending your application to Derek or Manjushri, we send it to somebody, another uh, uh, reviewer from, uh, but we, all, we do take into account that this person also do have psychology back. If your research also, uh, you know, that you might be even doing research uh, which might not directly be that, clinically focused on uh, psychology as such, okay? So suppose your research is in educational psychology, right? So somebody with the knowledge of the education field, okay? All right, at the same time, knowledge about uh, educational psychology also, at least a general knowledge about <laughs> that area. We, we do tend to take that into consideration. Yeah. Thank you, Jasana. Um, it's also true that again, we're only looking at these applications when there's a human component, right? So I've looked at applications from other schools, you know, at this point, and I will acknowledge that, you know, I'm happy to serve. Um, I would be more than happy to share the load. Um, you have to be an associate professor above to serve. So as you all move up through the ranks, it would be great to get some of you involved. So, um, at this point in your career, you know, it's not too hard to look at these and say, you know, is the way that they're engaging the methodology that they're using to work with the people, all of those various issues, you know, are these ethically conform to what is expected? Uh, it's not that I'm getting into the minutia of how they're analyzing their uh, statistics or the, you know, the details with regard to all the specifics of the research methodology. Again, it's the, the people component. That's where we put our real right. focus. Absolutely. Thank you. And this is the online form for, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll, I'll share the link of this form with all of you. It's very easy to fill in. Actually, it shouldn't take too much time also. And uh, it, filling this form helps us to, you know, get to know, like, rather than sometimes, you know, what we were seeing before we created this form, um, you know, faculty members were sending us this huge, like 20, 30 pages document of the research proposal that they might have submitted to a grant for a grant application. PhD students sending their entire synopsis, okay, like pages and pages. Like it was becoming really hard for us to, uh, you know, review those applications. So this is the reason we came up with this uh, very easy to fill 
the form, just fill it in and you can uh, save, uh, save it as a PDF and download it uh, online. And then, as I said, just email it to us uh, at jgurirb.edu.in uh, 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 with any other necessary attachments that you need to attach along with it. So, of course, all research proposals should clearly outline and provide details of research objectives. These are all part of the form, research objectives, research problem, literature review, methodology, time frame, budget and personnel involved, and also very important ethical concern with regards to uh, informed consent, whether you are doing it in the form of a written informed consent, uh, sheet that is to be signed or even oral as I mentioned, a risk assessment plan, plan for data protection and also your plan for publication and is the dissemination of research knowledge uh, and, and uh, attach any copies as I said of any kind of tools for data. I'll share this PPT also with all of you so don't need to worry about it. Uh, the, any kind of questionnaire or uh, survey instrument, whatever that you'll be using for doing your data collection. So that's all. That's it from my side. Questions, queries, comments, disagreements? I have a question. Uh, as you mentioned that you need the entire science kind of entire synopsis. So is there any word limit for No, no, we don't need the entire synopsis. No, no, that's the reason we created the yeah, form. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Literature review, it's just in brief, you know, there's this little, there's one limit <laughs> in the form. Okay. So we have just the gist of your literature review, you know, not that entire blown up thing, you know. Oh, yeah, like share. So they just we recently revised this, it's been really missing and uh, being uh, happy, but it's just really, it's night and day. This is so much simpler. Because what we used to have is exactly what you're saying. They would just basically submit their proposal. Here is all the stuff they want to do with the expectation that it was our responsibility to somehow dig through and figure out what we needed. You know, <laughs> it was a lot of work. It was really difficult. This is much simpler. I prefer that they not, meaning the applicants, send me all this additional information. Because again, I don't need your literature reading. That's not the point of RERB. I'm looking at your methodology and assessing yeah. whether you're, again, what you're doing with the human population is that right. 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 I don't need all of the other stuff. If anything, again, it just makes it more difficult to really assess it in an effective manner. The literature review, what is here, you know, as part of the JOT form is, you know, you have to write it in very brief to show that you have identified the literature gap. To frame your research right, question. Right. I mean, obviously, there's the question. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. But I don't so need the eight page. You, you yeah. don't need, so if this is the literature, based on the literature review, this is the research gap that has been identified where, where I'm situating my research question. So that's it. So when you will go to the JOT form, you see that's why we have created this form. There are actually word limits, only those many words. No, that is why it yeah. should be there, otherwise it is yeah. incomplete. So uh, when, uh, when you go through the entire uh, form, the online link, they'll see that each and every uh, section of the form has certain word limits. So within those word limits, you have to just, just the gist of your entire uh, research design. Okay. Any further questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah please. Thank you for this uh, amazing talk. Uh, we actually need all this information. And I must admit that RERB has been very quick in the past. I've submitted a couple of applications and I got approval very quickly. Um, but I have that's probably your, your applications fell in the exam category, I guess. That's a, and yeah. one was the full review. Good, so yes, even for the full review, it must be worth pretty quick. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always good to hear it. Good. Most of the time, people are complaining. <laughs> I'm so happy to. We will. We will. We will make you an ambassador. Know, your you are yeah. What's your name? What's your name? Divya Bhatia. Oh, Divya Bhatia. Yes. Testimonial. Testimonial. And also the process is very simple. Okay. So I based on the talk, but I had three uh, questions actually. So one was regarding the verbal consent because what we have been doing is all this uh, informed written consent. So 
I would like to have exact guidelines from the person concerned as to what exactly has to be communicated to the participants. Uh, second is regarding children. So uh, because I have, I, I am thinking of working with children, but I have not yet collected in the, in the past. I have not yet collected data with children. I've always worked with adult participants, so I would, I would like to understand um, uh, who needs to. I understand that parents have to sign the consent form, but it's not just signing the consent form, but you need to really explain the research in detail. Not just parents, um, you know, in many cases, it could be whoever is the legal guardian. The parent might not be the legal guardian, or parent might not be there, you know, for a child who is in custody. Okay. So, whoever that is person who is responsible for the child.
but you know, also, you look for a journal that would not ask you to submit a ethics uh, approval letter. That's it. Yeah. 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 Because this is this is the request we keep getting every semester. Like I didn't think initially when I was doing my data collection or when I ran this study with my students, but now we have got this opportunity. We submitted an abstract. It's a Scopus journal. It's a so and so ranked journal. They are interested to publish our, but we just we need the ethics approval letter. I said, but. We, we at the ethics committee, if we would do that, it would be extremely unethical for us to do it. You know what I mean? Because the research has been already conducted. The paper has been already written. Issue a letter for you to just get a, get a clearance to submit your paper to the journal. That's extremely unethical for us to do it. No, I just asked because since it doesn't involve human participants, why not that So, so do the research very well at the beginning. Which are the journals that you are seeking to submit? If the journal really requires it, then plan ahead of time and put it in the application. Your application will be reviewed and cleared in the exam category. Okay, I'll ask one more question. <clears throat> in the seventh point for the ethics application, there's a mention of risk assessment plan. So when you have like a project, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But what about some research papers? Or you know, when they have come into the category, it makes sense. <laughs> what are we supposed to mention or write under the risk? For, for that, there is no there is no need for risk assessment plan only comes if your research involves high risk. For uh, human participants of research. That's when the risk assessment plan comes. This is something we sensitize this uh, PhD student, as I just mentioned, who was seeking to explore negative emotions by doing certain experiments, showing some pictures and images and photographs. And that. So the first thing we asked him is, what is your risk assessment plan? Because, you know, he's seeking to explore Emotions, not just any emotions, but negative emotions. Fear, anxiety, anger. So it could really be all kinds of raising for the research participants. Any other questions? Guys, hello. Any other questions? I think it's refreshments time going on for everyone. So Professor Mosumi has to leave uh, at five. She has a lecture today. Um, otherwise, she would have been with us, you know, till six thirty, and we would have clicked a group picture with her. But I could I still here for another ten minutes. But so, any questions? I'm still here till five. Don't worry. <laughs> Manjusha, I was just remembering you. Me too. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you.
Hey folks, uh, five minute break, wash around whatever, yeah. uh, five minutes, no more please. Oh, okay. My apologies, I can't be, sorry, we're going to do a picture first, uh, please stick around. Yeah, I know that I would never notice Thank you. 
Maybe we should have the same. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so we are on time. The I think the mic hates me yeah, right no, now. Both on, me one should be off. Only yeah. One be I'll on. just say one line. Um, let's just welcome Professor Arpita over here. And it's a very funny story which happened day before yesterday. And I think otherwise, uh, it was highly likely that we would have lost one of the speakers. Um, so Professor Mosumi had a 5 p.m. lecture, but she had, uh, by mistake, you know, she had agreed for the workshop. I wrote to Arpita Gupta, thinking she is this Arpita Gupta, that, you know, if they would like to swap the lecture, you know, something like that. And then I realized, oh, my God, I made a mistake because I did not see the email ID. And I said sorry to her. Then Professor Mosumi wrote back to me saying, hold on. I would actually like to swap the sessions because I have a lecture and that's how the whole event could take place. So sometimes mistakes are great. So here we are. So we have uh, Professor Arpita Gupta and we have another Professor Arpita Gupta over here. Let's welcome Professor Arpita, um, who's been kind enough to agree uh, for the session. And uh, I, I would really say she was really, really, really kind to us. Uh, for everything and for suggesting the other names as well. So um, over to Deepak, who would introduce her. Professor Arpita Gupta is a professor of law faculty, uh, professor of law in the global law school, which is well known. Uh, also, she's a vice dean at the office of the dean of research, which handles projects, grants, and publications. Among other things, she contributed. One of the most important thing is she was uh, assisting with uh, streamlining the research-related process, and also most importantly, university's grant office, which provides uh, full support for um, any externally funded research project. So we are glad to have you uh, and uh, learn from you about uh, grants, which all the professors want to have. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I'll be talking about two things. First, I'll briefly introduce our office, and then we'll focus on external and internal research grants. And uh, let's keep the session interactive. So even while I'm presenting, any question that you have, we can discuss, because uh, um, we are still in the process of uh, setting up processes, research-related processes at the university. So any interaction um, with the faculty members, any particular challenges that you are facing would be really helpful in building the institution better. So um, I'll briefly talk about our office first, and then we'll discuss the two kinds of grants and uh, the steps and processes here at JGA. So our office was established in 2020. It's a new office. And uh, it's a university level office. So we work very closely with research deans of all the 12 schools, as well as the three research institutes that we have, um, and also the 55 plus research centers that we have. And uh, we have primarily three focus areas, projects, grants, and publications. So I'll very briefly um, give you some statistics on publications here on the slide. We also prepare the university's research at JGU brochure that is here with me. Um, and we circulate it every quarter among all faculty members. So we do an analysis, an analysis of uh, research and publications of all the schools as well as the grants that we have received along with fellowships, etc. And uh, now I'll very briefly take you through some of our major initiatives. We have First, we have the general research facilitation program, which is an ideation to publication programs meant for faculty members in general from all the schools. And uh, there are two steps, two par par parallel steps. First, 
where uh, we hold seminars and workshops on all the important aspects of writing a paper, right from how to identify the journal, what kind of title to choose, research questions, methodologies, etc. And then we assign a mentor or a collaborator for each participant to work on the paper. So usually this program runs during the spring semester. Um, this week itself, we set out the calls and uh, you can respond to it if you're interested in the program. Then we have the faculty development workshop series and our focus there is on research ethics, publications and funding. And uh, our first workshop is going to be on Monday 13th where uh, we have invited a scholar to discuss his journey as a global Fulbright um, scholar. And uh, you're more than welcome to join it on, uh, we've already sent out the flyer today for further information. And then we have the general researcher in residence program where faculty members from the university can invite their collaborators or potential collaborators to come on campus and work with them. So um, the collaborators can come stay on campus and teach, um, teach um, let's say one or two credit course or um, work with one of the research centers. The possibilities are endless. They can be joint seminars, et cetera. And then we have a research amplification program. It's a new program where uh, we try to ensure that our publications reach wider audience. So we are working on this particular aspect. This is the most, uh, this is a new initiative that our office has. And then finally, our office has also established a grants office where we deal with all the aspects of the two stages involved in a grant process, pre-award to post-award. Um, here are some of the statistics on grants at JGU. So we have, yes. Related to the previous slides, so you mentioned the collaborators, they can um, be here, stay on campus, uh, do research or teach. So I just wanted to know how is this visit funded? So we provide accommodation and uh, all other facilities, but uh, we don't yet provide flight tickets. But apart from that, staying on the campus, library access, food and everything is covered and trip to and fro from the airport daily. So um, this is how it's funded through our office. We have a budget for that. And uh, is there any um, uh, eligibility criteria? Yes, definitely. So it's there on our website, general researcher in um, residence program. And uh, we have eligibility criteria. It's open to faculty members as well as PhD students, right? So um, I can share it with the research office and then they can share it among the faculty members of the school. Okay. So here are some of the statistics on uh, funding that we have received. So um, since 2009, we have received over 4.54. So this is an old slide. Um, so we have received over 4.5 million US dollars. And uh, the funders, so we have a combination of funders, public, private, national, international. And uh, some of the ongoing grants are from a variety of funders. For example, DFAT from Australia. We have uh, recently received a um, huge grant from Welcome Trust and uh, NIHR from UK um, uh, and uh, British Council. And Manju, what was your uh, funder for your grant? HRC, HRC from um, the UK. And then we have AXA from France, GIB from Germany. So right now, uh, there are 16 ongoing projects. And uh, we also have internal grants policy and we have funded over 40 research projects internally as well. I'll talk about both kinds of um, grants in a bit. So first talking about external grants, here on this slide you see two stages, pre-award and post-award. And uh, we try to provide support for all the stages involved in a grant process. And um, I know there's a lot of uh, content in the slide. If you have any questions with respect to any other as any aspect, we can discuss it. So um, let's go step by step. So talking in terms of pre-award stages, the most important stage is identification of the grant. And um, there are various kinds of grants, and there are multiple sources for grants. 
So um, I'll talk very briefly talk about one of the sources that we have subscribed to. We have recently subscribed to the Pivot RP database, which is um, the largest database with funding opportunities, fellowship opportunities, awards, conferences, etc. You can also find your potential collaborators on it if you create an account. So we have subscribed to it and uh, we run sessions on Pivot RP and uh, wait for our next email where um, you can create an account and then you can also attend the, the session regarding the photography. So um, now they also said, so my experience tells me that not all the grants are listed on the photography. So you have to keep your eyes and ears open from uh, for all the sources possible. There are calls for grants issued and our office also we circulate calls for grants um, once a week and um, we we'll start doing it from the next week itself since the semester has just started. Now the second aspect is understanding the grant and the fellowship requirements. This is the most important stage because um, each funder has different requirements and you need to align your interest with the funder interest. And um, the funders usually have a call for grants, but then they there usually is a very lengthy document which talks about different stages. So, for example, the first stage would be um, submission of a proposal, which is a short proposal along with budget, timeline, etc. And uh, once your grant is approved, then we would ask for further details. So, um, now writing of grant application and proposal is extremely important because that is the crux and um, the kind of research questions that you have identified and uh, the kind of experience you've had and it's really important to look for collaborators at this stage so you can find collaborators within the institution through pivot RP, or you can use your um, your other contacts in other universities and uh, when we are talking in terms of the kinds of grants so I'm talking about external grants. So if we talk in terms of ICSSR, DSIR, the Indian government grants, then um, it can be one individual, it can be a um, couple of individuals who can apply as co -PIs. But then ICSSR also has provisions for um, collaborating with scholars abroad. So I'll just show you their website in a bit. That will give you an idea about the kind of research opportunity that they have. But when it comes to international funders, each funder has a different requirement and you have to very closely go through the call and the rules. So um, there are a lot of restrictions and limitations that at times, uh, for example, um, most of British Council grants require you to collaborate with the British University. Same goes with DFAT grants of Australia. So um, it, you need to put in a lot of time and effort in the beginning itself. And then once you have prepared the preliminary draft of an application, it's really good to get feedback and peer review, get a peer review done of your grant application, uh, especially the proposal part. Now, um, after that comes the stage of application submission and acknowledgement from the funder. Um, all the funders, they have different mechanisms. So there are portals for most of the funders. So you need to familiarize yourself with the portal, with the respective portal, please don't wait till the last moment because sometimes it's really, really complicated. It really, it's really helpful for you to familiarize yourself with the portal. So usually you have to create a login and uh, then go through all the stages of submission, upload all the documents. And uh, most of the funders, they require documents from the university. So um, this is, the steps and processes, documents that we share with the faculty, we write to them every month or so. And um, it tells you about all the processes. So now processes can be of two kinds. First, the funder related processes. So for example, they might need an institutional support letter from your university, or uh, maybe a due diligence form, or maybe a gender equality statement. So you need to inform our office in advance, at least two weeks in advance, so that we can prepare these documents. And uh, then even within JGU, there are lots of processes. So we also work as a liaison office and uh, we deal with the finance, with the registrar's office, with the HR and other offices. 
And uh, so it's really important uh, for you to let us know in advance, at least 10 days in advance. And uh, once you have submitted your proposal, make sure that you have submitted it properly. You need to have the acknowledgement from the funder. And uh, the next is the announcement of the awards. So either they can intimate you or the office, or they can just release it um, online. And uh, once that is done, the thing doesn't, uh, the steps uh, continue. So for example, once a particular grant application is accepted, then there are lots of uh, procedural matters that need to be taken account for. Starting from the grant agreement, the collaboration agreement. So let's say you're collaborating with an American university, a researcher at an American university. So there has to be a collaboration letter between the two. And then budget funding. And I really want to emphasize this one point. Most of the funders presume that universities will fund the project and then claim the money or the funds in areas. At GGU, we do not have that. We always take advanced funding every quarter or uh, depending upon the number of installments. And uh, that's how we fund external research. So we have a different process for internal research. And uh, then, uh, so I was talking about agreements. There are other kinds of agreements also that are usually involved in any grants. So for example, intellectual property, and if you have to hire RAs, et cetera, and um, the grant agreement, most importantly, needs legal and financial vetting because it's the university who's signing on the behalf of the faculty member. So we need to ensure that our legal interests are taken care of. So our office looks at legal vetting and financial vetting as well. And uh, then we also get the document signed, the concerned document signed. So once this initial these initial documentation um, are prepared and shared then comes the process of actually executing the project so at that time you need to hire RAs for example and uh, when you are actually preparing the budget usually the funder would ask you to reconsider the budget you know so sometimes maybe the proposal is really good but then the budget appropriation is deemed to be something that can be revised by the funder. So you need to be very careful about budgeting. We also have institutional overhead um, charges that we charge at the university. But apart from that, there might be GST implications. So that's why we have to be very careful with the wording of the documents, of the agreements. And uh, if it is an international grant, then uh, we can actually get exemption from paying GST, but then it has, it depends on the terms and condition of each agreement. And uh, we actually um, sit with the, um, with, with the faculty members and then we come to a conclusion as to what should be the deliverables, what should be the content. What do you mean when you say all the institutions have institutional overhead charges. So for example, at JGU, we have 10% of the funds received because we are administry. And um, so it, it right now it's 10%, but then um, it depends. So for example, for consultancy, we have it for 20%. There is a separate policy. I will not be discussing the consultancy policy, but if, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer um, questions with respect to consultancy policy also. I will just acknowledge uh, for comparison's sake, um, in the US we call it direct and indirect costs. Yes. Ohio State, indirect with 30%. So 10% is very, very modest. It's nothing. And you know, sometimes they're under restrictions. So for example, DSSR and uh, ISSR, um, they permit only 5% institutional overhead. Then we charge only 5%. So it's subject to the funder conditions as well. But uh, most of the technical universities, they charge 30 to 50 percent, um, and uh, especially for institutional consultancy projects. So um, now um, I want to, so, so once the project has um, taken off and uh, the deliverables are actually executed, then comes the stage of post-award management. So even after a particular project has been completed, there are certain things that we have to keep in mind because funders 
since they're funding us, they have the right to audit the accounts, etc. It's really important to maintain accounts. And uh, I would actually want our faculty members to educate themselves on all of these aspects because ours is a new office. We um, help through all the stages, but it's really important for faculty members to be proactively looking at their um, budget and timeline, etc. Right now, here, so these were just the technical aspects involved in any external grant, but then I do have some suggestions. So when you're preparing your grant application and when you go online and check the funder website, you would always see or mostly you would see the list of previous awards that gives you an excellent idea as to what kind of research proposal will get funding for sure. Right. And uh, time and planning are crucial because if you're collaborating with multiple universities, you need um, letters from them. You need collaboration agreements and uh, timeline is really important because each university has its own institutional processes and steps in place. Right. And um, apart from this. Project management is really important. So um, for really big grants, it makes sense to have this subhead within the budget, which is for a project manager. You can hire a project manager and um, Till you hire a project manager, you will have to be the manager of your project. So you have to be very careful as to how to balance time because we are teaching and we are researching and we are working on research projects. Um, so these things are um, really important. Now, I was just, yes. Can I have a question? Sure, sure. Uh, so regarding the international uh, collaborators, I was just wondering if the agreements that you're mentioning, they are the agreements which are generally through the IAGI office, which are the general agreements between the two universities? So those are memoranda of understanding and uh, those are different. Um, these are project specific agreements. Those are general agreements. Even if we don't have an MOU with a university, we can collaborate with them. And uh, these are project specific agreements. So for example, if you're working on a research project with uh, let's say Yale University, then the agreement would be between you and the researcher, our registrar and their sanitary authority regarding the budget, regarding the roles and responsibilities, dispute resolution is really important. So all of these clauses, um, they have to go in in this particular agreement. How would the funds be shared? So for example, for uh, funding from UK, US, Australia, the funders give entire funds to the universities there, and then they transfer funds to us. So then they carry out due diligence process, etc. So that so that's another example of an agreement between um, two institutions. Um, so there are legal offices in most of the universities, and uh, they share the drafts with us. But uh, in our university, I look after that. Um, we are still establishing the office. Get in touch with your office, and your office will be having conversations with us, and we get assistance in all these. Yes, right? yes, and uh, but do give us time because we have over, over forty projects running, so we have to strategize um how to contact finance. It makes sense for us to um yeah, collect all the queries and documents, and then um submit them to the registrar's office once or twice a week. So unless something is extremely urgent. And uh, I do get a lot of questions on FCRA. So FCRA is um, the foreign contribution record for the certificate. And uh, we have an active FCRA since 2015. Now what the government is doing it, they are renewing it automatically every six months. So this is one question that I get from all the funders, but it has never lapsed for us. And uh, we are getting funding. We already have worked um, on a lot of international collaborations. So that's not, uh, that, that has never been an issue for us in the past. It's unlikely to be an issue in the future also. Um, now, very briefly, so for example, I, um, this is the ICSSR website. And uh, they have a lot of programs and services. So you can apply for fellowships, research projects. They have minor and major research projects. It's really easy to apply, and even the amount of funding is quite a lot. 
and um, um, their formats are also very simple. So, for example, their budget format is so simple. But if you're applying for an international grant, you have to prepare an entire Excel sheet. You need to prepare a Gantt chart for the timeline, etc. So this is very simple and very straightforward. Um, and then they also have provision for international collaboration. This is something new. And you can also conduct training and capacity building uh, workshops, which I think is especially re relevant for this school. And um, now let's very briefly have a look at uh, Welcome Trust. Um, so they actually fund um, projects on mental health and climate and a lot of issues, infectious diseases. And uh, so if you go through the the guideline, you would see the areas that are covered, the procedure that you need to follow, and the restrictions that they have, right? And restrictions can be country specific also. So you have to very carefully look at a particular call for funding. And uh, so even for uh, applying, they have online portals, so you need to create um, your login ID, etc. And sometimes, so for example, if you are taking funding from European Commission, they would require the institution to first enroll and get a PIC number. So we already have that. And if a faculty member wants to apply for a program, so for example, uh, recently two of our faculty members have applied for Jean Monnet Chair and Module, then we uh, share these other details with them. Right? So now I'll just try to briefly talk about internal grants. For internal grants, we have a revised policy and it's available on my HR portal. The HR has also circulated this policy to us. Um, as for this policy, there have been a lot of revisions. So I'll just go through some of the important aspects of the policy. The three kinds of grants that we have, short term, medium term, and long term. Short term is for six months, um, the duration of the project. And uh, it's uh, the maximum amount that can be claimed is five lakhs. Then we have medium term for 18 months, that corresponding amount is 10 lakh. And then long term for two years and for 20 lakh rupees. So what is new in, the new, in this policy is the structure. Earlier, we just had one in Donald Grants Committee, but now we have a two-tier structure. We have a School Research Grants Committee, and then we have the JGU Research Grants Committee. So you, the team members, need to be in contact with your school SRC. So you submit your proposal in the given format to SRC. Once the SRC has collected the proposal, they, um, they need to actually vet it. They need to assess the um, application and then give the decision to the GRC. GRC meets every three months. And uh, once the GRC also approves, then the, um, the project gets approved. And uh, what else is new? Well, there are, so this is a much more organized policy in the sense that the formatting requirements are very clearly laid down. So, for example, um, when you are submitting the application, there has to be a, a cover sheet, but then it should also have the proposal itself, the title, the scope and objectives of study, methodology, time frame, budget deliverables. And uh, this time I have introduced five annexures. The second annexure is actually the budget to format or draft, because uh, that's one area where most of the non-economic background faculty, they struggle. Um, so we have the application cover sheet as annexure one, budget temp template as an annexure two, and then we have an interim report format, project extension format, and final report format, right? And um, there is something, um, another thing which is very new is the matching funding that provision that we have for inter-university collaborative projects. So let's say we are collaborating with another university. They have agreed to um, put 20 lakhs into the corpus. We can do the same. But then it is subject to the terms of this particular policy. Um, there is one, um, there is another clause that I have not mentioned here, which is regarding Scopus uh, Index publication. So the requirement for short-term grant is at least one Scopus um, index publication, medium term two, and long term three. This is something new. And so, yeah. And then, within the duration of two years, 
you can you commit your you conduct your research and then you're given 18 months. It can be used for 18 months. It depends. So if it's a short-term project, six months, medium term, 12, and then 24, right? And then you can also hire student researchers. And uh, we have a limit for how much you can pay them per month through the fund. And you have to very clear, very um, carefully look at the policy because it lays down very clearly what you can spend, what on what you can spend and on what you cannot spend, right? So for example, principal investigators, they don't get any stipend. Um, and uh, there are also limitations as to um, the kind of uh, things you can spend on. So for example, if we already have resources in the library, which can be substituted, so then you would get recommendation on that to revise your budget, right? So um, these are some of the important aspects of the internal grants policy. And uh, additionally, we also have a consultancy policy. So whenever you're taking an, any consultancy, um, for any consultancy with uh, any outside organization, then we have a very detailed policy. Uh, what is the procedure? How should you be going about it? What permissions are needed, et cetera? So um, thank you. And if there are any questions, let me know. Is there a template for the research proposal submission? For? Uh, for instance, for RERB, we have a sort of a template. But we for internal grants, yes. Yeah. So the, all the annexures, so annexure one and two would be helpful for you um, at this stage when you're submitting. So the next uh, JRC meeting, which is the university level meeting, is going to be the end of this month. So if you are interested in submitting, I think um, you should do it within the week. And we already have a committee for the school. Um, so you just need to. So the committee should be sending out an email to the faculty members of the school, and then you should be submitting the proposals to them. They'll collect all the sub, um, proposals and then share them with us. Um, and I would recommend you to share them with us by 23rd or 24th of this month. Pretty maybe you can share that again, now that everybody kind of understands the process. Yeah, I will send it to the and um, there are some so there are some errors in the policy, but it will take a while to get it rectified. But these only pertain to the annexure numbers. Annexure one is application cover sheet. Annexure two is the budget. That's what you need at this point. And uh, please make sure that it, it has the title, the methodology, and all the things that I mentioned in the end. Well, we didn't even talk about RRB. We should have both for internal as well as external grants. If you're doing human subject research, then you need RERB permission. Even for external grants, it's really, really important. Um, so our institution, you're aware of the RERB policy. And uh, once you have uh, you have been selected or your proposal has been selected, and if it ha if it has a component of human subject research, then you should definitely get RERB approval at the university. So is it before the application? No, yeah. after after the application. Right. So when we are, for example, when we are preparing the legal documents, you can simultaneously sub submit it to the RERB. Right. So that takes time. How often does the uh, you by the research committee meet? Every three, every three months. And um, so earlier the frequency was different. The policy was suspended for two years during COVID. We have just renewed it. And we're going to meet in um, end of February, early March. And uh, then three months after that. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't even talk about the substantive aspects because I know Mona is here. And um, um, if there are no further questions, then we can actually proceed to her having. Um... So uh, earlier you were talking about gender research and application program. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that brings to my mind the question of okay, if we are looking to publish, right, uh, let's say in an open access journal. Does the institute or, uh, you know, OER 
uh, support that process in this end? So we are actually in negotiation process with um, some of the companies like Taylor and Francis. And um, so the process is still ongoing. So we might purchase a subscription for them from them, a particular uh, subscription where they would uh, um, allow the first 25 publications from their journals to be open access. So we are working in that direction. We are working very closely with the global library also on that one aspect. We're also going to have a series of lectures by global library in collaboration with our office on open access, how to make more things open access. My question was coming from a place where a lot of open access journals either have institutional tie-ups or uh, ask if the institute funds or supports. So, the giants, so that's the thing I'm talking about. So we we'll definitely have tie-ups with um, some of the major publishers. Um, but, but if you are uh, working for a research grant, and then you want to publish out of that, it makes sense to include open access fee in your budget itself. Publish in a Scopus. That's your call. It's not difficult to publish in Scopus. We are, you know, they have so many journals. Please do, because I think you all know at this point that's a big part of your annual evaluation. Yes. So you need to publish in Scopus. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks, Professor Arbita. Uh, I'll request uh, Professor Delic to. Um, Give the word of thanks for Professor Arpita since she'll be leaving in some time. In some time, but yes, before 6 15. We're doing it now? For her, yes. You have the three towels. Well, thank you, Mel. Are we posing for pictures? That's on your screen. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so over to Dr. Mona Mittal. Um, it's really amazing to see, uh, you know, one of our speakers yes. sitting here and listening to everything uh, since you were talk. Um, Professor Nitika will be introducing Dr. Mona Mittal. Uh, so, Dr. Mona Mittal is an associate professor in the Department of Family Science, School of Public Health at the University of Maryland, College Park. She has received her PhD in Marriage and Family Therapy from Texas State University and a Master's in Clinical Investigation from the University of Rochester. Uh, she is a core faculty for UMD Center for Healthy Families that provides uh, mental health services to individuals, couples, and families. 
She's also an affiliate faculty for UND's Prevent uh, Prevention Research Center that focuses, among other areas, on LGBTQ plus mental health. Um, she's also associated with UMD's uh, Population Research Center that produces and promotes population-related research. Dr. Mitchell is engaged in prevention and intervention research focused on mental health and traumatic stress, particularly interpersonal violence and sexual and reproductive health outcomes among populations that have experienced health inequities. She's currently leading a qualitative study to further understand the intersectional stigma and mental health related barriers to engagement in care among black sexual minority men living with HIV. So over to you, Dr. Mona. We are waiting to hear her experiences on grant writing. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's truly a pleasure to be here. I have been sharing with uh, all the faculty that I have been meeting personally that this is the first time I have been in a university setting other than 25 years ago when I was a student in India. And it's, it's amazing. I have met phenomenal faculty while I've been here. I have met amazing students. And uh, I'm really thankful to Dr. Pallad for making this happen and giving me the opportunity to be here. <laughs> Um, so I think I'm just here to share my experiences. I think there are some questions. Um, I had shared a concern with Dr. Pallet that I did not know how relevant uh, my experiences would be because they are primarily in the U.S. And of course, the context is very different. But as I've been sitting here and listening to the research talks, I have been blown away. Um, I shared with uh, Dr. Mukherjee um, that, you know, it, I came in into the U.S. in a very established environment where you really don't think about what goes into IRB, human subjects research, and just seeing the amount uh, that Jeju has done in just 13 years and the amount of dedication and keeping up with international standards, I'm just tremendously proud of and uh, want to rave about the institution as I head back and Starting an office of research, I just cannot imagine your life. So that will be for a private conversation. But um, I'm just, uh, I think some of my experiences might be useful, even though most of my funding has been uh, from the US. So I think I'll wait to be asked um, the first question. How, how and when did you really start working on? Runs post to a PhD. Great question. So, you know, I was reflecting on some of these questions, so I took down some notes. Um, I had gone to the US about 25 years ago because I really wanted to get some expertise in traumatic stress. Um, I did my master's from Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai, and I worked with the special unit uh, that was with the police. Some of my faculty had recently started that. This was in 96 to 98. Um, and what I was observing was a tremendous amount of pain, um, a lot of women not, you know, wanting to lead relationships, and that was sort of the significant recommendation. And of course, I was seeing the amount of trauma and that it would nearly be impossible for them to be anywhere else. So I actually went to uh, the U.S. because I wanted to understand how do you effectively intervene in these situations. Um, and particularly, you know, when you experience trauma, it takes over your entire life. And you start living very much in those moments and it prevents you from moving forward. Um, and I also really wanted to develop programs. So my goal was to learn how to do intervention research, but also learn how to develop programmatic initiatives and then integrate them into community-based organizations. Um, so the training program that I chose from here, who knew, right? You apply, it's far away. This was in 97. Um, so I had definitely decided I wanted to do couple and family therapy, but my program was much more clinical, much less research-oriented. Um, so after I graduated, you know, I had this thirst uh, continuously about how do I develop as a researcher, um, and also what do I want to study? You 
know, I think that's really important. I mean, you do so many things as a PhD student. You get exposed to different things, but what was truly my passion? It's really hard to know. So again, you know, you start small just by writing some research papers. First of all, I don't know how you all are doing, but it was a huge learning how not to be a student, right? I mean, I'm just like, I just graduated and what? What do you want me to do now? Uh, and I was not much older. In the US, a lot of students are older. So in fact, some of my students were older than me. And uh, so I think the first couple of years were more just adjusting to be a faculty. I also realized how Indian I was by being an academic in the US because you know nobody has to reflect about who you are in terms of your values. I mean, I was who I was, but I learned who I was much more when I was in a different system and in a position of authority. All my Indian self started coming out. So I think my first two years were a tremendous amount of growth, personal growth for me. And also spending some time thinking about what is it that I was really interested in. I knew trauma was something I was very interested in. But um, I also sort of, as I was thinking through, I realized that there is not a lot of funding for trauma-based work. Just by itself, even though trauma is a significant aspect of our lived experience, and way more common than it should be, there's actually very limited funding um, for wanting to study gender-based violence or other forms of trauma exposure. I soon realized that if I wanted to do something, I had to tie it with a health outcome because health is what gets funded. Not so much mental health too, there are some, but it's more physical health outcomes. And you know, what happened was I read a report that said uh, at that point that India had surpassed South Africa in the number of HIV cases in the world. And that was a shocking report for me because I, that was not an India that I could relate to and I had not left that long ago. Eventually the UN recalled the report and said the numbers were wrong, they apologized. But by then I had started reading about HIV and I was very, very curious. Um, so as I started reading more, I learned a lot more about the interconnection between gender-based violence and HIV. I learned that women were at a much higher risk for acquiring HIV than men. I learned that HIV, um, like gender-based violence influenced, um, was a risk factor for about 12 to 22 percent of HIV among women. It just blew my mind. Um, and I was a clinician, right? So instead of asking so much about why the connection, I wanted to, I want to do something about this connection. So that's how I got hooked and I found my passion. But it was a journey for a long time. I had no idea. And then started the process of cold emailing people saying, I really want to study this. Would you be my mentor? Because, you know, you really, it's very helpful to have mentors. I cannot tell you how many emails I sent and I got no responses. Um, but, you know, I had good mentors in grad school, particularly one that I was very, very close to. And um, I was, while I think I've always been an extrovert, it was very hard to be in a system where I had to learn how to talk, talk to program officers. Who are program officers? These are people usually in funding organizations. Um, that uh, know about the grant portfolio, right? And you can actually schedule a phone call, you can write to them. If you're, at, I mean, what I learned that you, each one of you has a, a big amount of money that's given to you for traveling to conferences. Uh, and which, you know, compared to what I get, it just feels like huge to me. Um, but learning to meet program officers at conferences, I cannot tell you, I had to practice so much with my primary mentor, who was amazing. Um, I would practice what to say because I was so anxious. You know, I had so much of imposter syndrome. I was like, what do I ask? Uh, what do you, beyond hello, I have nothing else to say. And what if they ask me something? So I would encourage you, if you are feeling that way, right? The program officers are really there because they want to encourage new scientists. And it took me a very long time to understand that. But I would highly encourage you, whether I don't know how the Indian system is, 
you know, if you can contact somebody at ICSSR or some other funding agency to be able to speak to them, even though there's information on the website, I would highly encourage you. And if you are feeling vulnerable, practice, practice, grab a colleague, learn, write out questions. Uh, because you are each other's best sort of um, support system. You're all in this together. So slowly I developed confidence. I approached a very senior person at my university. I was at Syracuse University then too, and requested him to be my mentor. He said no. The one thing I think I've learned over time is you have to have a very thick skin. Don't be afraid of rejection. And I know it's much easier said than done, but you cannot survive in the field of research if you do not have a very thick skin. Um, there is no research that's 100% like the best research project, right? Every project will have limitations and people will give you feedback. Sometimes people won't even read what you do and just write something up and it's very disheartening. Take your time to grieve, get angry, stomp around, but get back on it because otherwise, I think we are the ones that suffer. Um, so this guy, you know, I approached him and he said, I'm too busy. I can't do this. But I kept showing up in his office. Uh, so he finally said, okay, go read all these papers and come. So I went, I diligently read everything. I made notes. I came back. I kept doing this. In the end, he says, okay, fine. I see your passion and that's why I'm saying yes. So I think don't be afraid uh, of being tested. Um, I also work on issues that are very intense, including HIV, and I work in the US. Um, so I work on the populations that are high risk for HIV in the US. So for example, as you shared, one of my projects is with black sexual minority men. I cannot tell you how many times I've been told, isn't this a problem in your Indian community? Why are you studying this? Why here? Um, and I just have to sit down and hear that and not be defensive and engage in terms of why am I interested, right? As a researcher at a humanistic level to convince organizations to partner with me. And I win some, I lose some. So I think there have been a lot of experiences around that in terms of writing my first grant, um, getting rejected, looking at the feedback, making changes, submitting it again. So I think what I think one really needs is grit, consistency, and being extremely tenacious and not giving up and believing in yourself and the work that you want to do. I wanted to add here, they, we have these statistics where they talk about the success rate of grant applications. So uh, one out of 10, that's the average. That's right, I think that out here. <laughs> I don't want people to be disheartened, but that is the truth. I have a much larger portfolio of unfunded proposals <coughs> than I do of funded proposals. So keep going. Can I ask, because now uh, I think I've seen faculty members whenever they apply, they also mention their unfunded ones because earlier they would not add that in their CV. But right now I've seen the trend that, you know, they do acknowledge that they've actually spent. And if they have gotten funded, uh, they were funded, then they do add that. But they do add the ones that were not fun uh, funded as well. On their CV? On their CV. So there's mixed opinion about this. So for a while I had my unfunded grants on my CV. But that was more because of promotion and tenure requirements in the U.S. Where, of course, if you get funded, it's fantastic. But a lot of the tenure application review is also based on how much effort you make to get funding. However, I have received consistent feedback post uh, promotion and tenure to take all of those out from SPB because it shows more how unsuccessful you were than you were successful. <laughs> so just take it out. So, but then there's a context. So when you go for tenure and all that, yeah. Then you write every minute thing that you've done and say that miserably, it's completely okay. So how about in grant proposals when you are actually writing your bio sketch and everything? Uh, does that have value to write that, uh, you know, say, for example, you might have one funded project or two funded projects, but you must have written 10 projects that were unfunded. Not relevant. Yeah, it's all based on the work you have done, not your potential.
the question is on the dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I have a question. What are the challenges you have faced over the period of time uh, while writing in different practices? Because each and every proposal, you know, all the calls have different requirements, different ways of writing. Yeah. And even if you have prepared one proposal, so you have to keep changing it. <laughs> It's a great question. And I think Dr. Gupta talked about this, that when you identify a cause, you really need to know it really well. Um, so I came a lot of trees, unfortunately, because I'm not a good reader on the screen, but I can uh, really chat. Um, that's all right. Thank you. Uh, so um, I typically tend to print out uh, the call and sit with it with a marker and read it intensely, right, to understand the language, to understand what exactly they're looking for, to really understand even, uh, so NIH has a very typical format, right, so I know there has to be, um, you know, an abstract, a significant section, an innovation section, blah, blah, blah. But if I'm writing to another agency, I have no idea what they request, and they're very, very different. I was to try to find out who else has been funded through this particular organization, this particular mechanism. So for NIH, as Dr. Gupta talked about, I mean, she didn't specifically mention NIH, but she said that you can look at who's been previously funded by this call. I would highly recommend that for whichever mechanism you're applying for. NIH has a, um, a portal called eReporter. And you all, if you have collaborators, you will be able to apply for NIH funding that allow for international work. So just bookmark this eReporter. And I'm happy to show you when I'm at a computer that how you can do some searches. You can do searches based on every grant uh, call has a number. I come. Um, every grant call has a number. You can put that number and see, you know, what previous titles have been awarded. You can put just a topic and see, okay, gender-based violence. That's very broad. It'll pull up a lot of things, but you can, and what you see is the title, what mechanism it was, because NIH has many different mechanisms, just like you have here, even for internal, you know, a five lakh, a 10 lakh, but they have different names and different mechanisms associated with numbers. Um, so it's extremely important to see what's been funded and what the priorities are for that particular funding organization. If you can get a hold of proposals that have been successful. That was my next question. And even if not successful, it's really helpful. I cannot, writing, writing is not an easy endeavor. Like we think just because we know English, let's just go write. I cannot tell you the rest that I receive and still continue. So don't, as you mentioned, get someone else to look at your proposal. I would even say an editor, right? It's fantastic. For my first grant, my university had an editor that could be hired. She had some PhD in English, but she had worked a lot with writing grants. So really new how to make it punchy, how do you use adjectives, how do you use verbs that really speak to the reviewers, right? It was very helpful. It was such an, and I learned from the edits. So when it comes back all marked red, pay attention to the edits. What is this person doing? I think we're academics for a reason. We have capacity to deal with this, unlike my teenage son who looks at the edits and like, mama never likes anything I write, right? It is a very different experience for him, but looking and seeing what the editor has done is extremely helpful, has made me a tremendously better writer over the years. Um, and really, if you can get some examples from people who trust you, because of course this is confidential information, and not a lot of people will share, which is okay, but if you can find people to share internally as well, you know, you seem to now have people who are getting awards. If you develop relationships, I mean, they can keep all the confidential information just if they can share the proposal. And once it's funded, it's actually public domain in a lot of places. 
it just takes time. Like for an NIH research, I can apply from, I think based on Request for Information Act, it's a, in the public domain. It takes them to several months because they sit down and make things black. You know, you've seen those documents. But it comes, it just takes a long time and we don't have so much time. So it's nicer to be a good colleague and to share proposals that we've written. I was, uh, I was just thinking about the Ford ideas grant um, after hearing you speak and uh, their requirement is just 50 words. You have to communicate your idea in 50 words. If they like it, then there is no limit to the funding that you can get. So that's why when you talked about hiring a grant, um, a writer or using the right adjectives, it's so important that yeah. every word that you use is really important. Which 50 grant? words. Ford Ideas Grant. Thank you. I have faced a lot of rejections uh, when it comes to grant applications. <laughs> so uh, recently, yes. the recent uh, rejection has come from ICSSR. So one of my mentors, uh, she, she said that uh, it's very important that you publish in whatever area you are applying for a grant. So we were just discussing about therapeutic jurisprudence. So she said that it's important that you publish and we need to publish that, that really increases the chances that you <coughs> get to grant. So I just wanted to know your opinion about this, that is it like that's how we go about it? Does the chance of getting the grant really increase if at least we have a publication in that way? I think that's a very strategic thing to do actually. So Manushri and I have been talking about we really want to do more gender-based violence work here. So we just did a systematic analysis and a, a meta-analysis and a systematic review, just planning ahead because we really want to show one, a collaboration, right? That we are effectively working together. And two, that we are already, so it's a very strategic thing to do is you write the paper and then you write these are the gaps, right? So you are already putting down what the gaps are and then you follow it up with a grant so that you can say this is already documented in literature such a significant gap. And, and obviously it's not just one paper, right? You build it over time, but it's really, really strategic. Because why will we pay you money? I mean, these are taxpayer dollars in the US, in, in India, it could be, you know, foundation, it could be some other government money. You really do have to show that you have the expertise. So partnering initially <laughs> with some senior people would be extremely important. So forming, but one of the things I would say is, you know, and this was great advice that was given to me, start a dating relationship, right? So you date multiple people right now. You don't, as a young faculty member, spread your wings out, talk to many people, and you might be doing the heavy lift and that's okay, right? But it's really nice because everybody has a different working style. Right, we just heard about RERB's um, um, review committee. Some people are being dropped because they're not pulling their weight. They're not completing the um, promise that they had made about leaving X number of proposals. They would definitely be not good people to partner with, right? So that's why dating is good because dating with researchers, uh, academic dating, uh, <laughs> you're testing it out, right? And no stakes. So it's a paper, it's some data collection, and you see what their follow through is. If they are not responding, if they think too highly of themselves, whatever the reason is, maybe that's not a good partnership where you write a big grant together. So I think you do have to think through, and it takes a little while. I would say also, I'm not great at this, but several of my colleagues are phenomenal. They've started their labs. You know, I, I was not exposed to a lab in a social science field, um, but I think some of the younger faculty that are graduating and coming in are really growing up even in the social science field in a lab setting. And these lab settings are unique. They find a name for their lab, right? And they they are so savvy and you must, I'm, I'm not so savvy with like social media, uh, with setting up a website for my lab, but I am just blown away. Right? So that's also strategic. Right, that you set up a lab name, you create a web page. There are lots of places that offer free, like that's your own personal web page. So you can also put it in your signature in your email. 
new publications as soon as they come out for the link. I don't do any of this. The important thing is this is called gracious self promotion. Academics are not taught, particularly women academics are never taught. Don't put your hand. Indian faculty to all be good. Eh? Like, don't say anything good about yourself. These are very important things to learn. These are subtle, but they make a huge difference, actually. So the term gracious self-promotion is something that we all need to just embrace and be really proud of. It took a long time to write that publication, so why not? So if you have a lab page, I think it's nice to put your small picture, write a little bit about, so just as you read a bio, have a bio of what you're interested in. I know it takes a long time to write these things, but have peers read it, ask people to give you feedback. If you have students, get their pictures and you know what are you working on together. If you have projects, even if they're not funded projects, they are important projects. Um, write a short thing on each. These are good ways to publicize your work. If somebody's you know, Googling your name, things like these will pop up. It's really helpful. So I don't like that. I can share a short story with you very much. Just, uh, so I was on a, a study section um, where the grant was being reviewed. It was actually an R01. Everyone agreed it was a very well written grant. But one of the reviewers was Adam. This was a new researcher. They only had one publication and they had put in the wrong grant. They should have done an R03 at this time. So it was ultimately rejected. So the point of the story is uh, perseverance is key. Lots and lots of rejection in this field that we're in. But it's also about trying to target where you think you're most optimal with respect to receiving the grant. Right, so it's good to be ambitious, but too ambitious may seem like you're you're not quite ready, which could negatively impact your odds. That's right. And in the US for NIH, when you want to talk to a program officer, typically what we have is a concept sheet. So just talking to somebody is not super helpful, like at, you know, at the funding organization. What's really helpful is you develop a one pager. Concept. Concept sheet, right? So the concept sheet really is three main questions, typically, but in a very succinct form, right? It's like what RARB did is everybody was submitting their entire proposal and they was like, we can't do this. Here's a form, there's a word limit, put it in here, right? So we need to learn how to succinctly explain our idea. Oftentimes in the US, I've heard of things like, what's your elevator pitch? Right? So it's like those 500 words. If you're going up to the fourth floor with somebody, what are you going to say to them about your work and why should they find it? So the concept sheet is not an elevator pitch because you get one A4 size paper. Uh, but typically, the three questions that you answer is um, what, what, what is the current status of the field? Right? What is um, happening? Um, what is the gap? Um, and then what are you doing? And how, by doing what you're doing, what is the public health significance? Like, what's the importance of this work? So those three things, if you can succinctly answer in a page and then send it across to the program officer or whatever language is used, and then ask for a time to speak, to say, you know, I'm really interested in this. It really aligns with the call that you have. I'm sending you a concept paper. Can, you, can I please get some time to speak with you? Okay. You keep using program officer. I really don't know what the analog here is. I, there, there, there's, I mean, maybe ARPA is the program officer, but it's. it's look for it's funders, not, for funders, right? The funders program. Um, so Do they all have it? In ICSSR? In ICSSR, no. But I think international grants mostly do. They're coming to ICSSR, ICSSR, they're coming social scientists. Yeah. Social science. Yes, sir. They have as well. yes. But right. they do have a but I don't think so. They are very um yeah. they, that has changed. changed that has changed now. Many of our faculty members have received ICSSR grants and they're very prompt. The ministry tells them exactly what to do, what not to do. They yeah. take calls and they respond to emails, which is new, but it has happened. Like they yeah. are great yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have not received any uh, response from them, so I'm assuming my grant is rejected. 
So because if I, after you have received the grant, it has then they answer your question. Okay, so they don't tell <laughs> those uh, those oh, that <laughs> grants are rejected. At you. No, no, they don't have that level of transparency as of now. But at least they are corresponding with people um, to whom they are giving the yeah. funds. Yeah. But I would say make use of conferences, even if you're not traveling at the India-based conferences. India does tend to host now a lot of international conferences. We were just talking about the mental health, global mental health conference that will be in Chandigarh in September. Um, it would be a great place. And again, people really want to talk. Researchers, senior people, if you've read their papers, you really like their work. I know I was getting pulled the other day by Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Sadi who was making fun of me that complete American, everything is wonderful, it's so nice, blah, blah, blah. But it is true if you do it genuinely, not sort of make it uh, false. But most senior people want to mentor the next group of people. You are the next group of scientists. I mean, a lot of you are newly finished from your PhD. And you know, most of the older folks, they're moving out. So they're really interested. So I think the hesitation is more within us, within you. I would highly recommend that if, if there are people you see they're coming, make the time, so can I please have coffee with you? I'm really interested in your work. That's what I'm trying to do here and just get the conversation going. Any other questions? I will say coincidentally, that's exactly almost literally word for word what I tell our students if they're interested in doing research if they start to approach you all. That's right. It's all developmental, right? We all have the same challenges. You know, just one thing, you know, how to keep the you know consistency going on. At times it happens that let's say you're not partnering with anyone, you just go on your own. Uh, at times you get selection, you know, few times you get selection, you know, but then there are phases you have to in, in apply and continue with them. And then you have other you know, responsibilities also right. going on. So how do we, you know, really schedule the things? Because uh, like if you know that if you just put in 100% at one place, you will definitely get, get that thing. But how do you go about when you are you know, managing uh, three different things, which might be requiring the same skills as that is required in something for that or This is such a great question because we are pulled. I think academics is one profession where you have to wear so many multiple hats and change them very frequently. And you get pulled in so many different directions um, that it's really hard to sort of prioritize and then be consistent, right? Because right now you're not getting the time release to write a grant. You still have to do your two two, you still have to do your committee meetings and everything else, and then you're finding whatever minuscule time you have, and you are publishing in Scopus index journals. I mean, it's just a lot of intensity. I and mean, most people outside of academia don't realize what academia is, right? So the main question is, right? I mean, I'm sure you're also starting to hear that. Exactly. So, it's a good profession, but it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. So, uh, I think these are the challenges that people outside of academia, particularly in institutions like this in India, where we are changing the culture, it's really hard for people to know how difficult the life is. And so, I think this is so cliche, but I have found that. You know, if I work like crazy and I don't build the time for myself, I burn out. These rejections are tough. I mean, however thicker skin I may have, I literally poured my heart and soul into writing this proposal. I literally told my kids, talk to me tomorrow or 10 days from now, mama is missing in action, right? And then the grant even doesn't even get discussed. Forget uh, not getting funded. There's no score on it because... They sent it to three people and they didn't give it a high enough cutoff score, right? So it's very disappointing. Sometimes I can't even look at the summary sheets when they come. I'm just being honest. It's, it's a very tough, tough field. But I think you take time to just put it away, focus on your stuff. What do you need? Having a more regular, as I get older, I realize having a more regular practice. 
practice of whatever self-care looks like is extremely important, what grounds me. And also connecting back to what makes me passionate. Like, why am I doing this work? Because in the end, it starts becoming meaningless right? and meaningful. It becomes meaningless when your rejections are so high and I'm sitting in my office and just typing away, right? What gives me pleasure is going back to the people that I engage with. And then I realize this is why I do this work. So whatever fuels your passion, and I think it's okay if there is, you know, moments, periods when you don't write like a grant. And for me, I'm, the, I'm my hardest critique, right? So I hold myself to such a high standard that I'm not allowing myself to breathe. Then you didn't do anything, right? It's more me than other people that are sort of thinking, okay, what is this person doing? So I think what my work is trying to give myself some space. And it's really okay. During COVID, I didn't write a single grant. <coughs> and that was okay. And I got so many requests to review. I was like, what are people doing? <laughs> Please God, please give us the uh, time energy. And then, you know, I'm just like very trying to survive here. Um, and it was what it was. So I think that, and I think working in teams is helpful. Doing it alone is not sustainable, I think. So you might be successful for a little while, but eventually you might want to get a team around you. Uh, so Dr. Mittal, can you submit one proposal to multiple funders? No, 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 no. You have to tweak it. You have to the same proposal for Shimala. That's a very tough one. I don't think so. It's like, <laughs> if you publish a paper, you cannot sort of publish it somewhere else. So the idea, you have to have a different aspect, right? So maybe you wrote a grant, it got funded, but maybe there is an extension or an idea that, you know, it's starting to grow that, okay, then you can write another grant, which is an offshoot of your first grant, but not the same idea. So because multiple submissions are usually not allowed in social science journals, for example, but in um, US law reviews, for example, you can submit it to multiple um, journals. So I was just thinking, do we have different jurisdictional practices with respect to research grants also? Talk about the journal article? Yes. I never submitted to a single journal ever that you could submit more than one place. So and there's usually a little box you have to click to say specifically. Yeah, I have not submission. But yeah. uh, so so for the, the law reviews, US law reviews, you can submit one yeah, article to very, very different process. So maybe 50 journals and then you can negotiate. So let's say if a rank 100 journal select, then you can talk to 50th and then so that's possible. So I was thinking if we have a similar thing for funding also. So I published a law journal or a law article like two years ago. It is so weird. <laughs> it, I mean, it's literally it's, it's completely night and day relative to the way like psychology typically works. Yeah, it was, it was really bizarre terms. Yeah, but if you submit a grant and it doesn't get funded, then you can take the same proposal and send it somewhere else. But not simultaneous. Not simultaneous. Okay, so uh, let's just find it up today. Uh, it has been a long day. Tomorrow we're going to have Dr. Mona Mithil. Uh, so if you have more questions, do come. If you don't have questions, please do come. <laughs> we have the guest lecture tomorrow at 4. Uh, you've already received the email and do uh, tell your students also to come and join. Um, so I will just thank the Professor Arpita and uh, Dr. Mona Mittal to be here and give their time. And over mm -hmm. to you, Derek, for the word of thanks. Well, thank you very much. I think it was a very informative uh, engagement today, uh, both to me as well. So, um, you know, again, a lot of you are at that early stage of your career where these grants are really important. They help set you up where you can really kind of proceed and do the research that you want to do. Um, Certainly, we have a lot of students that are interested in doing research, but if you have money that you can provide, uh, you know, all of that's going to really further your career and everything that comes behind it. So, um, I'm going the rest of the committee. Really, I think this is a great organization. We have the RERB procedure, we have the grants on campus, and then the first-hand experience. 
So uh, I hope everybody really enjoyed it. I hope you all got something out of it. And uh, I want to specifically acknowledge uh, both Dr. Arpita and Dr. Mona. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Yeah, it's done for the daily. Thank you so much.